let's keep on going, and I want to talk about various types of what might, we might call unnatural monopolies. So these are going to be cases where there's more or less nothing good to be said about the monopoly, at least not unless you're the monopolist. So increasing returns to scale and intellectual property monopolies, we did have some offsetting benefits, and that might make it worthwhile. But what if we have a system where we have some kind of licensed monopolist, where one firm is just given the exclusive right by the government to be the monopolist here? Well, in that case, we're going to have a situation where typically the fact that the firm needed the license means it's probably not a natural monopolist, which means that while it might be more efficient to have two firms in the market so that they could serve the overall market at this low level of average costs, we're not going to get that. So we're typically going to get higher costs than necessary. And that's actually going to be only half of the badness, because not only are we going to have higher cost than necessary for the production of the good, we're also going to have a higher level of markup, because when each firm find, when these firms find themselves without rivals, they're going to go ahead and increase the markup and the amount that they charge for their goods. So that's a pretty bad situation now. Sometimes we don't have a deliberate creation of a monopolist, we certainly don't have that much of it um, in a country like the United States. But we often have mergers. And when we talk about mergers, there's actually at least two different types. There's what we call a horizontal merger and a vertical merger. And a horizontal merger is between firms that are competitors. So horizontal mergers almost always are going to increase market power and lead us at least a little bit closer towards a monopoly. And thus, antitrust authorities tend to be highly suspicious of horizontal mergers. Vertical mergers are with a firm's suppliers, so the people who are sort of upstream of them, or their buyers, the people who are downstream of them. And these tend to be not that much scrutinized by antitrust authorities because they don't systematically increase monopoly power. Essentially, these are often about firms want to be able to work more closely with their suppliers and therefore they're going to go ahead and merge with them. Or they want to be able to have a secure and reliable source of supply, so they're going to buy their own suppliers. Or they want to have more control over how their product reaches the final customer, therefore they buy the person who ultimately retails their product, for instance. So, you know, these again are, the horizontal mergers are highly suspect, and vertical mergers tend to be not very suspect. There are sort of complicated cases, and in particular, you might sort of look at what goes on in the technology sector as an example that's kind of intermediate between these. So if a company buys another company that has, so we have a big company like Google or Microsoft or something, and they buy some other company out there that's working on another product, and they incorporate it into their own website, it's a little bit unclear whether or not that's a horizontal merger or a vertical merger. I don't know. We might call it a sort of diagonal merger. And it might be that right now, that small firm they bought up, it's more like a vertical merger. But given time, you can see how if that small firm had innovated and created new products and grown, it could have become a horizontal competitor. So this is something where I think probably antitrust authorities haven't really figured out what to do. They tend to create, tend to treat them as vertical mergers, 
but at least in my opinion, they should maybe start to look a little bit more forward and think about how they might be a little bit more like preemptive horizontal mergers. So mergers are a fairly frequent way that we have an increase in monopoly power. And government licensing does tend to happen somewhat. For instance, some states, only the government stores are able to sell liquor, or we have something like the post office or something like that. But oftentimes, people think that monopoly comes from control of natural resources. And that, you know, someone's the monopolist because they have a monopoly on the supply of something. And it's fairly hard to find cases where this is really realistic. So, you know, sometimes people say, oh, what about Saudi Arabia and oil? But if you look at it, Saudi Arabia, though they have a very large fraction of world oil reserves, they only have about 10 to 12 percent of world oil production. Or you have something, some people say, oh, let's go ahead and look at De Beers, which is a large company that does a lot of diamond mining. And it's true that they have sort of organized something of a cartel, but there is a big difference between having a cartel, a group of people who are banding together to attempt to act like a monopolist, and being an actual monopolist. Because if you're a cartel, you always have to worry about balancing the interests of your members, and are people going to cheat on the cartel, and so on and so forth. So I'm really pretty skeptical uh, of how often it happens that we get a monopoly through control of natural resources. Sometimes we do see that one country has a particularly large share of production. So in recent years, China has been a very, having a very large share of the production of what are called rare, rare earth metals. Rare earth metals are these sort of obscure minerals that are used in a lot of electronics. Um, and at one point during a dispute with Japan, China cut off Japan's supply of these rare earth metals um, and really hurt Japan's electronics industry. And what has ultimately happened then in response to that is, well, it's true that the current production of these things was highly concentrated in China. But once China attempted to exploit its monopoly power, then people started wanting to reopen rare earth metal mines that had gone derelict other places. And so someone's ability to actually exploit their market power, even if they do have a large fraction of the control of natural resources, is often very limited. Because very few resources are so heavily concentrated in one particular patch of the earth. You know, even if we were to extend this to all of the Persian Gulf and add together you know, Saudi Arabia plus Kuwait plus Iraq, plus Iran, and of course those countries don't always get along with each other. Even if we were to add up all of the oil in the Persian Gulf, we would still only get to about 30 or 40 percent of world production, which obviously doesn't make you anywhere near a monopolist if you only control 30 to 40 percent of the market. Okay. <laughs>